something that fills you with inexplicable joy or enthusiasm or makes your heart beat just a little faster? For me, that thing is our oceans. I've had this obsession with the ocean and the life that they hold for as long as I can remember. When I was young, I had tons of books about whales and sharks and dolphins, and I tried to memorize as many species as I could. And whenever we went to the beach, I would just stand there and stare out over the water, wondering things like what alien-like creatures lived down below and what these creatures did at night when us humans went to sleep. And when I was about seven years old, I was at a summer camp at the aquarium. And I remember they showed us this documentary about a small whale that had beached itself and needed hospitalization for having swallowed several plastic bags. Now, as um, many of you can imagine how most seven-year-olds would react, I was horrified. Um, I had this intense anger at humanity for doing this to the animal and empathy for the animal itself. It was the first time in my life that I felt extremely passionate about something, so I resolved to dedicate my life to saving the whales. And I therefore decided to become a marine biologist because that's what I thought marine biologists did, save whales. Now, of course, at the time, I didn't actually know what being a marine biologist entailed, but it didn't matter. I set my sight on this goal, I haven't looked back since, and I've been sort of figuring out along the way what kind of marine biologist I would like to be. Now, of course, over time, my views have evolved and changed a little bit. Um, as I was sharing my story about the whale and the plastic bags, I'm sure many of you might have been thinking, wow, yeah, that is sad, but don't we have bigger fish to fry? Doesn't humanity have more important issues to address, like food insecurity and poverty? Well, I would agree. These issues are fundamentally connected to the health of our oceans and the life that they hold. So today I'd like to shed light on how what happens in our oceans directly impacts human well-being around the world, and therefore how it is our responsibility to take care of our oceans. So when I was young and still super angry about how everybody was killing our oceans, I would often proclaim that everybody should just stop eating seafood. My mother was always very quick to point out that not everybody in the world has the luxury to choose. So one thing that the oceans do for humanity is provide food and jobs. Fish are the primary source of protein and essential micronutrients for over one billion people on our planet, many of whom live in low-income areas with low food security. Now, unfortunately, our global fisheries are facing a crisis. Many scientists estimate that if we continue to harvest fish at the rate that we currently do, all of our fish stocks will collapse or be unfishable by approximately 2050. Now, as with any shocking statistic, there's some debate in the scientific community as to when exactly this will happen, but the trend is very clear. And part of the reason we find ourselves with this problem is that we've just gotten too good at catching fish. Some of the biggest fishing nets in the world are so big, they can fit 13 jumbo jets inside them. So this image that I'm showing you was released by Greenpeace to convey that fact, and I think it does a pretty good job of uh, conveying the idea, except I have one qualm with it, and that's that um, if you look at the shark and the uh, fish on the right-hand side of the image, they are so not to scale. Um, that shark should be about a fifth of the length that it was actually drawn compared to those big uh, Boeing 747 jets. But I digress. Um, now, another thing the oceans do for human, or sorry, um, what, another thing that we do is take more than we intend to catch. And this is something known as bycatch. So species that weren't targeted end up on board and are exposed to the air for a very long time. Um, and so there often is high mortality. So if you looked at this image and guessed that it was um, showing the catch from a shrimp troll, you'd be correct. But clearly there aren't many shrimp to be seen in this image. And often what fishers will do is they'll just toss the dead bycatch overboard because it's not as valuable as the species that they were targeting, and they don't want to waste valuable freezer space on board. So as large industrial fishing fleets are racing the, around the world, fishing for profit, um, unfortunately the losers in this arrangement are small-scale fishermen who only catch enough 
to feed themselves or maybe uh, provide for their families to sell at a small local scale. So when all of our fisheries are collapsed, it won't only be a story of environmental degradation, but also a story of people who are faced with uncertainty as to how they're going to continue to provide for their families and live like they have for the several past generations. Now, um, Taking less fish is only one small part of maintaining healthy oceans. We also have to consider the whole ecosystems upon which these fish depend. So fish themselves need food, and they eat things like smaller fish and invertebrates and algae, and they also need shelter. And all of these things are found in coastal ecosystems where there's a lot of vertical structure. Ecosystems like coral reefs, mangrove forests, kelp forests, and uh, my current research system, seagrass meadows. So these uh, coastal ecosystems are some of the most biodiverse areas of our oceans, and they form the basis of many important and complex food webs, so they're super interesting to study. My research specifically is trying to figure out what environmental and spatial conditions create patterns of animal biodiversity in seagrass meadows along the BC coast. So this here is an image of myself doing uh, field work on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, and I know I'm, I probably look super peaceful and tranquil and just chilled out underwater, but I'll just tell you that in reality, when this photo was taken, I was actually shouting expletives in my head um, because I don't know if you've ever tried to seal a Ziploc bag underwater, but it's really hard. Uh, it's really hard to do without all the contents shooting out under pressure. But um, I exercise patience because understanding how these ecosystems can maintain biodiversity will help inform how we can protect them. So another crucial thing these coastal ecosystems do for humanity is act as a buffer against climate change. And climate change impacts all of us in landlocked countries and coastal countries alike. So in 2015, governments all around the world decided that they would try to keep global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius pre-industrial levels through the Paris Agreement. However, a lot of research has found that what governments have pledged to do in the Paris Agreement is not nearly enough to meet this target. Cutting down on emissions isn't enough. We actually need to find ways to suck more carbon out of the atmosphere. And this is something in the climate lingo known as carbon capture. And though many companies out there are trying to develop fancy carbon capture technologies, it just so happens that there already is a gigantic natural carbon cap capture mechanism available to us. That's right, it is the ocean, uh, and specifically these coastal ecosystems that I was talking about earlier. So organisms like phytoplankton and coral symbionts, mangrove plants, and seagrasses, they all take up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. In fact, organisms in our ocean are responsible for about 55% of the total photosynthesis on Earth at any given time. Now, after um, the carbon dioxide is taken up from the atmosphere, these organisms sink the carbon down to the seafloor, where it gets stored there for a very long time, away from the atmosphere and the greenhouse effect. So it really is in our interest to protect the health of these coastal ecosystems so they can continue to do this um, and act as a buffer against climate change. However, unfortunately, we haven't been doing a very good job of that. For instance, seagrass meadows are in global decline due to a number of anthropogenic stressors, like uh, agricultural fertilizers making their way into the ocean and causing algal blooms and outcompeting the seagrass, and physical fragmentation due to boat propellers and coastal development. When I learn things like this, I'm just as shocked as when I learned for the first time that whales are eating plastic bags. That hasn't changed. But some of the anger has dissipated. I can't just point a finger of blame at humanity on the whole because these issues are incredibly complex and involve a lot of stakeholders and actors around the world, from the small-scale fishermen who just want to put meal, a meal on the table, to policymakers who decide how we use marine resources, to us, consumers, who also use marine resources and have goods shipped long distances across the ocean. So it was at this point in my journey that I developed a side interest in political science to understand um, how pow power dynamics between government, corporations, and civil society, us, can be leveraged to re uh, reverse degradation in our oceans. And I was able to experience 
um, how this really works at the international level last fall at the 23rd United Nations Climate Conference in Bonn, Germany, or COP23. And when I got to the conference, um, I became excited because COP23 has actually been nicknamed the Oceans Conference because the host of the conference was Fiji, a small island developing state who really uh, does understand the importance of the oceans and its link to climate change. And they influenced the tone of the negotiations quite a bit by calling upon governments to include marine conservation and sustainable shipping in their commitments to the Paris Agreement. Now, while I think this is a step in the right direction, I do worry um, that a lot of what happens at these high-level negotiations won't work fast enough because a lot of us are experiencing the impacts of climate change right now. The people who influenced me the most in Bonn at the conference were not powerful government negotiators, but rather regular people, um, especially from small island states who traveled a long, long way to Germany to share their stories living on the front lines of climate change. I met one woman who traveled several days by boat and plane from her small village in Fiji to Germany to share her story. She told me that, as of recently, it can take up to four or five hours of swimming around in the ocean to find enough food for her family, and sometimes she can't even find enough. She's been watching over the years the coral bleaching in her backyard and is convinced that it's the dead corals and the warmer sea temperatures that have caused this decline in fish. I also met a girl my age from Kiribati, which is another small island state in the South Pacific. And a few years ago, the president of Kiribati recently purchased land in Fiji, a different country, resigning to the reality that his citizens will have to move someday soon when their homes are submerged by sea level rise. And my friend told me that many of her uh, community members have already lost their homes and lands to floods. So this is happening in real time. And as I mentioned earlier, the ocean-mediated impacts of climate change are not exclusive to small island states. We, too, will feel, will feel the impacts of climate change right here in Vancouver. So a project by Climate Central um, has visualized the extent of sea level rise in many major cities in the world. So this is a, an image of downtown Vancouver. On the left-hand side, we have a 4-degree Celsius warming scenario and a 2-degree scenario on the right-hand side. And the areas in blue are the areas that are currently not submerged but will be submerged in those scenarios. And the first thing that struck me when I saw this image is that the entrance to my parents' building is underwater. Um, and even if you don't live in those areas that will be impacted, we will still have to pay for damages and invest in, in new infrastructure when this does happen. So as taxpayers, we all pay the price for climate change. Now, it's understandable that sometimes we feel somewhat removed from issues like pollution and overfishing and climate change because a lot of what happens on our planet is happening on a spatial scale that is far larger than any human observer and on a time scale that is far too long for us to witness and understand cause and effect in an intuitive way. But this doesn't mean that it's not happening. We must be mindful of what's going on on our planet, even if it's out of direct sight. And that is where all of you can be a part of the solution if you so choose. So in my mind, there are three tiers of action that any individual can take to solve any issue faced by um, our planet. And so I'll use the, the oceans as an example. Um, the first thing that you can do is, and the easiest thing that you can do, is just make small individual lifestyle changes, um, like reducing your plastic consumption, like reducing your seafood consumption, or if you do choose to have seafood, make sure it comes from a sustainable source. There are a lot of eco-labeling companies, or you can ask the restaurant that you go to where the fish came from, and even if it's not sustainably sourced, just asking them will cause them to think about where they're getting their seafood from. So I'm sure, I'm sure many of you know that, um, these, are, th these are things that you can do. Um, the second tier of action that you can take is to take individual actions and go to group actions. So things like telling your friends or hosting awareness raising workshops or even contacting representatives in government to support marine protected areas um, or uh, other things like this. And the third tier of action, which I think is the most relevant to this audience of university students, is to actually find a way to make your career path relevant to um, conserving our oceans, even if you didn't get a degree in marine science. We need everybody, uh, all 
people from all walks of life, lawyers, policymakers, business people, resource managers, all on board to represent the interests of the ocean and to tackle these complex issues. Scientists cannot do it alone. So just as, a, as some parting words, um, over the years, I have learned and experienced many things that my seven-year-old self would not be able to even dream of. She'd be so excited if, she, if, she, if only she knew um, what was to come. But a lot hasn't changed since that time in my life. So I still go to the ocean, and I'll stand there and stare out at the water whenever I get the chance. Um, and sometimes I'm tempted to feel overwhelmed, like the scope of and complexity of the problems that our oceans face are just way too complicated for humanity to tackle. Um, but I'm filled with the same joy and excitement that I was filled with as a kid, and that really gives me the courage to not give up hope. And I hope all of you feel the same way. Thank you. <laughs>